Excellent. Well, thank you for coming. I think various people will be coming and going and dropping in and dropping out uh, throughout the afternoon. But uh, and I appreciate it's quite difficult when you're speaking to an audience you can't actually see. Uh, but the, the useful thing of this, I think, will be an opportunity to put something together which is both useful now and we can save a, 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 an edited version to give people lots of useful tips and ends later on. So the, we've got, I'm really pleased with the panel of speakers that we managed to assemble um, for this. Uh, our first speaker is Holger Graf, who is the General Manager of Display Solutions for Vivitech, also has responsibility for Delta with the um, LED screens, uh, and has a, a, a comprehensive range of meeting room technologies as well. And obviously one of the things that's clear is that for collaborative systems, there are a number of ways in which you can achieve a similar result. Um, Holger has his um, product, which is uh, the typical uh, interactive touch screen with lots of functionality built in around it, serving as a hub. But there are other ways in which uh, his uh, uh, NS series of products can be used to achieve similar objectives. So I thought, for if you could introduce for 10 minutes, the options that people have whether they're trying to put together a system for education or for work or even a personal system to become a remote participant or worker in in this sort of distributed workplace. Um, so if we can have 10 minutes, that'd be grateful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. Well, actually, we started uh, many, many years ago uh, defining a product uh, to be used in the education environment. And uh, of course, we had to accept that um, students bring their own devices with them and they want to connect to any existing uh, device already. And uh, we learned that uh, there were quite a few obstacles in using the product from user friendliness point of view and also from the technical integration point of view. And uh, then given the European market situation with its diversity that uh, countries are uh, equipped in a different, uh, equipped as schools in different ways, uh, we also found out that the corporate side uh, uh, is a very important market segment. And today, the wireless collaboration market, according to future sources, about 75% in corporate business and 25% in education for many reasons. And so we adjusted our uh, product lineup um, to target much more the corporate market and uh, had to, of course, also consider that people can have software on their computer to realize wireless collaboration and people who are not allowed to put software on the computer to do exactly the same. And hence, we need to needed to have the external version that you can connect uh, to the display in uh, adding a small little dongle to it to realize all of that. And over time, we actually learned that uh, people um, use the product uh, always in stress situations because when you stand in front of a crowd of five or 50 people, uh, the product needs to work, not only from the way you integrate it, but also the way you interact with the product. And um, also according to future source, we have in Western Europe and North Africa about, uh, North America about 11 million meeting rooms. So there's a huge, huge potential for us to add the product in the meeting space. And uh, about 50% of all meeting rooms are equipped uh, today with displays, whether it's a projector or flat panel. So we have a great opportunity to upgrade rooms uh, to avoid the cable, because the ultimate idea to start with was to get rid of the cable. And uh, with that, uh, of course, we uh, see a great opportunity to um, advance and upgrade existing meeting spaces. Uh, and for those meeting areas where there is no display device, uh, we decided then to implement uh, or embed also the wireless collaboration inside uh, the display. Now, we did that first with, uh, with a touch panel, and as there was no category uh, called collaborative touch panel, we were the ones to invent this. Until then, there were only uh, um, interactive touch panels available. And shortly after, we learned that people actually also want to have the same display done with them without the touch functionality. So we introduced a product called uh, Novo Display. And so it went on and on and on. And uh, what we realized is that uh, we constantly need to focus on three main areas. And that's what we did and what we continue to do. And that is ease of use, stability, and uh, the integration of the product. And integration also includes um, security. 
So all these factors are very important when uh, dealing with uh, wireless collaboration in many ways. And uh, then, of course, it is um, the training of the product and the software, how we actually use the product. We had uh, discussions at schools where uh, teachers also asked us, well, we need to have airplay. And we were asking, why do you want to have airplay, for example? Yeah, they heard from the students they are using airplay. But it had nothing to do with how they actually collaborate or communicate. So it was, in a way, just a screen sharing element versus a collaboration element. So over time, uh, we found ways to um, satisfy most of the needs. Uh, still a long way to go in many ways, of course. But uh, I guess uh, a lot of companies today, and we include ourselves, uh, have viable solutions for uh, making sure that we wirelessly share content with, this, with the main screen and that we can collaborate uh, with a team and in a larger group in a very effective way, also then to share the result of what was discussed in a very easy way. That has uh, led us now to, uh, to a point where we introduce even Novo LED, uh, which is an LED-based uh, uh, display uh, that includes also our collaboration functionality and moreover also digital signage uh, features. So that's why we uh, started to communicate at, I, uh, at ISE this year that we um, have a Novo ecosystem because Novo stands for our Novo Connect wireless collaboration at Novo DS digital signage. Um, and in this ecosystem, we basically can go into schools uh, where we equip the classroom, the teacher's room, the cafeteria with uh, displays and technology that can be centrally controlled by the IT department because it's all based on, on one uh, operating system and a uh, standard principle uh, to make that very easy. And we can go into corporates uh, where we have uh, from the reception desk up to the meeting room, to a boardroom, to the CEO or whatever C uh, meeting room, um, uh, display solution uh, that supports uh, their daily routines and uh, sharing information. So uh, with that, uh, I think we have by now a multitude of uh, technologies uh, to be used as a display because that's where we come from. But the same principle to interact with display uh, from one to the other room. And I think that's uh, for us very important because mixing different brands, different products also means that you have to get used to how you press a menu button or what happens and how you can interact with it. And so that's a principle of our uh, approach to uh, make the use of the technology a little bit easier and a bit more flawless for all the employees. Uh, we did it ourselves in our meeting rooms in uh, Hofdorp in our European headquarter. And the first three months was for our support team a chaos because uh, people from HR called and said, ah, this doesn't work and how can I do it? And you know, after three months, they got very much used to it. And today it's a very flawless process. We get into meeting uh, rooms, we open our laptop, we start the software, we check the meeting room we are in, we press the button and uh, that's basically it. And, um, and so our own uh, teams need to use the technology and utilize the technology to the highest degree or the way they feel comfortable for us also to learn where we need to improve. And um, I think software always needs to be developed and you will never find an end. And uh, we all have our principles and philosophies how to do that. And um, it was a development cycle of about four years uh, that got us uh, to the point where we are today. And um, I think uh, we have by now a package that is rather solid. So that's, um, that's the way we, uh, we enable uh, collaboration uh, internally from a technical point of view, as we are the display specialists and that's our background, but also then now from a software point of view and from a communication point of view uh, to make sure that uh, all of this uh, works in a very realistic way uh, to the satisfaction of the user. Thank you. Um, perhaps we should take any direct questions now in case I understand. It's ISE rebooking, and there's all different things going on elsewhere in the show. But, um, but this is a question that was submitted earlier uh, this morning, which is from a school which said that they made an investment in displays, um, uh, which are HD resolution displays. They're not that old. They want to get they were bought primarily for showing movies to the class. Is it practical to use with combination of your type of NS products to use that without replacing, or is it something that actually 
it doesn't really work. You might as well scrap it and start again. Mm. Well, actually, in uh, schools, um, most of the products by now have HDMI input, and that's mm -hmm. all that is required. Uh, whether they have 4 by 3 or 16 by 9 aspect ratio is then secondary. But uh, as long as you have a display uh, device with an HDMI input, uh, you can upgrade uh, the uh, device with, uh, with a solution that we have, which is called Novo Connect, and we have the various types of that. Uh, of that solution and um, you know the basic I, the basic question is are the kids bringing their own device uh, into the classroom are they allowed to use it and is the teacher keen on uh, exchanging information that students have on their on their display with the rest of the class mm -hmm. uh, the feedback has uh, been to uh, at most of the schools that we talked about that this is desired and Scandinavia is of course quite advanced in that regard where uh, students bring their tablet uh, they have our software installed uh, or the app installed on their uh, on their device which is called Novo Connect app and uh, with that they just um, are in the school network uh, they connect to the classroom and then the teacher actually has uh, the ability to preview the student screen to make sure that uh, appropriate content will be displayed to the rest of the class and he can press the button and then bring the student screen uh, to the front uh, of the big screen and share this with the rest. So um, it is technically of course possible but it's also a matter of how comfortable the teacher is to do and to utilize uh, all the tools because again I think we ourselves in the industry need to ask ourselves always the question is the technology that we offer um, well, bulletproof is perhaps a too big word, but is it safe enough and easy to use uh, to make sure that in stress situations uh, that the teacher is then, uh, that it works always, is it stable enough and is it easy to use? So the short of the long is, yes, I believe the technology allows to do exactly that. And we have very various ways to realize that. But at the same time, it's also a matter of uh, philosophy how to, how to use it in the classroom. Thank you. I'm conscious of time, so one very brief um, uh, question. The matter of operating systems is that uh, I have someone that is asking here because they're nervous um, about using anything other than Windows. So, does it actually matter which operating system your systems employ? No, actually not. Uh, we support uh, all operating systems, whether it's uh, PC, uh, Mac, iOS, or Android. Um, from that point of view, that's actually very easy to, to utilize. Thank you. Um, thinking of the Craig's our next speaker, you may well have some um, input on, on that. Um, I'm really um, um, delighted to see uh, Craig Scott, who is president for Europe, Middle East, Australia, and New Zealand, Sonic Corporation. Um, he also has some involvement as uh, uh, in a some more CTO type type role. Um, so he's absolutely the right man to, to have here. I'm very pleased to, to see him. He's going to talk about um, the now that collaboration and sharing content are universal requirements for any business. Uh, Craig will explain diversity of options available from IT and AV solutions. I think it's true if you Sonic, you probably, I, I recently um, 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 uh, saw one of your displays, it's all about eSports. So there, there can't be anyone with as great a variation in terms of monitors, big large format displays. Or, so, so what's your view on the way that uh, collaboration is, uh, uh, is operating both at the individual level, because you do do products with individuals and, that, and at the corporate level. Uh, and what is your spin on the whole, um, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, operating system issue? Okay. Well, it's a good question. So you know, the topic was the future of collaboration, yeah, and yeah. unified communications. So it, it's a complicated problem because um, most of us in this industry really love our technology and we love our products and at the end of the day that's great and all good but the problem we really have to solve is how humans interact with it so human-centric design 
So if you look at the individual solo remote worker versus uh, a, a meeting space like this versus, you know, I say a, a virtual meeting space using Zoom, they all have very, very different human centric issues in terms of how you design the, the product. And then you have mixed spaces where you have some people like a video conferencing, you know, with people we don't know versus people in the space here. So this is a mixed space where we've got a virtual space and we've got a physical space coming together. So it's a mixed space. So when, when you look at technology, you actually, how it works is not interesting as much as what problem you're trying to solve. So if you're trying to do an individual, for example, video conferencing, and I'm a remote worker and I'm talking to a team, maybe you want to blank out the background, get rid of the ambient noise, you, you, you know, the individual video camera is looking at the person and just focusing on the person, not what's behind them. But then in the group space, you want to have virtual presence. So you've got two groups on either side, you need to be considerate of the body language and how the people are receiving you. So the camera angles are very important. So from my perspective, as we move forward, if you want to make collaboration work, yes, we have to be frictionless. It has to be easy. People have to walk in and feel comfortable. Uh, that's number one. Safe is a very good word. And I would say safe, it's more relaxed. Um, we all know if we're not relaxed in a meeting space or in any space, we don't do our best work. Stressed people can't be creative. You have to be relaxed. So these spaces that we're, we're creating, these collaboration spaces, whatever they be, whether they be mixed, virtual or real, they have to be relaxed spaces first and foremost. So the technology, it really has to play a back part to the actual space itself. So anything we do has to be frictionless. Um, the, the, the concept of inside and outside I, I want to bring up. Um, very different problems, uh, very, very different. If you're outside of the organization and you're, and you're going inside via, say, video conferencing, um, it, there's a lot of things that are missing. The ambient noise, the body language, the facial expressions, you know, the ability to look someone in the eyes. Uh, that's missing in, in, say, a virtual space. In a physical space, it's much more relevant. You know, you have to, have to look. So when you're planning spaces, you have to really say, what problem am I trying to solve? So in a classroom example, what, what's the problem we're really trying to solve? We're trying to solve the engagement between the teacher and the student. So screen sharing or video sharing or content is really irrelevant. What's really relevant is, is the teacher and the student engaged? And if they're not engaged, why? So the question we always have to ask is, why is, why is there not engagement? Why is there engagement? Okay. So in, in an educational space, for example, we're really focusing on engagement. Okay. Is the teacher and the student having a great engaging relationship? And how can we build spaces with technology? It might be physicality, it might be electronics, it might be software, it might be hardware. Who knows? But we build that engaging space. In, in say, a corporate space, uh, what is the desired outcome? What's the problem we're trying to solve for corporates? Well, it's productivity. It's creativity. You know, in one hour, how can we have a great meeting and get a productive outcome? How can we be creative? Again, we have to look at the problem statements. Uh, a lot of people turn up to meetings, for example, and don't, they don't even know why they're there. <laughs> okay, why am I here? What's the agenda? What's the desired outcome? What are we trying to achieve? So as much as we put all this technology into these rooms, again, we have to really focus on what is the desired outcome? What's the problem we're trying to solve? And, and problem statements should trump technology every time. Mm -hmm. I, I always say, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? And quite often, a lot of companies actually don't know the problems they're trying to solve. So really step back from the technology, look at the problems you're going to solve, and then you know, deploy technology accordingly. Uh, whether it be big and expensive or cheap and cheerful, who knows? Uh, it just depends on the problem you're trying to solve. The future of UC, in my opinion, is going to be software-defined collaboration spaces. Mm -hmm. So we will forget hardware. Just pretend hardware is like furniture and chairs. Uh, each chair, furniture and chair has a different function. You know, some feel good, some feel bad, some are big, some are tall, some are short. Well, hardware is going to be the same. There'll be big screens, there'll be little screens, there'll be projection, there'll be non-projection, there'll be speakers, microphones, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they'll be their functionality will be defined by software. So, if you look at software-defined networks right now, and say networking, we're going to have software-defined collaboration spaces. Um, the best example I can give you is pedagogy and education. Mm -hmm. You have the traditional instructional pedagogy where you stand up in your lecture, okay, the sage on the stage. And then we move to say the more collaborative scene where the guide on the side, where you have one-to-one -one, or you have huddle spaces or you, know, you have scale-up classrooms, for example. Now the pedagogy in terms of the teaching style is very different, so the technology has to be very different. Okay? Again, in, in, in meeting spaces, um, if you're having small creative groups like huddle spaces where you've got very much interaction between multiple people at the same time, that's very different to a, say a boardroom where someone's presenting a formal presentation. Okay, and then be more of a, I'm presenting, you're listening, maybe we'll do questions later. So again, you know, corporate versus education, different problems, different spaces, different sizes of spaces. So there's no one size fits all. Uh, I, I can't say this is the right technology or this is the wrong technology. But it's what problem do you want to solve? Okay, so that's the direction we're taking, very human-centric design.
On that question, I had a, a question submitted by uh, a consultant who specialises in user engagement. And, and her question is, there are so many different groups within the workforce nowadays. You know, you have your uh, uh, technically, technologically aware uh, youngsters, and then you also have people who not only are not aware, but they're probably quite reluctant to get involved at a certain stage in their career. Uh, it, it's so it's presenting a barrier. Is there a solution to how you deal with all of those different groups because their their requirements are very different? But you want them all engaged. You want them all productive. It, it's a great question. So the generation gap is clear and exists, and it's happening. The millennials, the twenties, the thirties, the forties, the fifties, all have very different ideas in terms of what is collaboration and how to participate in a conversation or an engagement. So bridging that gap. Uh, millennials, they like text messages, they like short and sharp, they want to be on their mobile handset. You know, 40 generation, they like laptops, they, they like formal keyboards, they like to present things. Uh, the millennials like to argue, they like to debate, they like to be right. So you've got all these different generational gaps. Um, this really becomes a HR issue more so than a technology problem. And, and training is so important. Um, what are the guidelines for an engagement? You know, how does this classroom work? How does this meeting work? What's our company culture? How do we run our meetings? What's the style of our meetings? So as much as there's a technology solution, there's actually more of a HR and a training issue. Uh, we have to teach people that we have to respect the different teaching and presenting styles and the different engagement styles. Uh, and the transparency on engagement is very hard to get when you have, say, a four generations of, of, of workforce. And the challenge we face is quite often the older generations set the tone and manner because they are in the senior leadership positions. But the reality is the millennials are coming through in the 20s, which have a very different idea. And they're the guys maybe in 10 years time who are going to be running the company. <laughs> so if you, if you don't accept that they have a voice at the table, you might lose them. And so you're, you're losing the future generations to run your business. So this is the conflict that's taking place in the workplace with collaboration right now. There's 100%. Millennials, I, you know, I'd like to work from Starbucks and do everything remotely. Their boss, no, you need to be at the office at nine and you need to leave at six. <laughs> no, 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 I work better at Starbucks. <laughs> so how do we accommodate both needs? Probably they're right, the millennial probably does work better at Starbucks. But at the same time, maybe he needs to develop social skills to learn to work in groups and physicality. So maybe he does need to be at the office, not because you need him at the office, but because you need them to learn the physicality and understand how to work with people directly. So to answer your question, complicated. And every company has a different approach. I, I guarantee it. there's going to be no standardization on this. The DNA that you set in your culture in terms of collaboration and engagement means that the technology you use is going to be used differently. If you go to a Facebook, for example, and you see how Facebook works versus, say, a traditional company, the, the workforce in terms of the physicality and the way they work is like chalk and cheese. There's no comparison. <laughs> it's completely different. As a supplementary question, which probably Holger will also contribute to, it, are collaborative solutions unnecessarily complex? Yes. Okay. There, there, there's, a, there's a great, there's a great you know, scientific, you know, science fiction writer called Arthur C. Clarke. I think it's rule number two. He says every great technology should be magic. And, and at the moment, we've failed that mission. Um, as, a, as an industry, every company has failed dismally on this one. The technology is not magical. You go in, you scramble for the cable, you scramble for the button, you can't work out how the computer, you ring IT support, you ring HR, the meeting's late, everyone's complaining, bored, things drop off. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we haven't done a very good job and it's not magical right now. You know the great thing about a mobile phone? Pick it up, you dial a number, push hit, you get to talk to somebody. Uh, we're not there yet on collaboration. Okay. I, I agree. Uh, the thing is, um, we, we learned that in the hardware when we tried to uh, have a system that we can embed in the wireless network easily, it wasn't that easy because uh, the network operator has its own philosophy how the network is structured and so it caused all kinds of uh, little barriers. Once this overcome, uh, it's getting better. But um, that's why I said earlier, and I fully agree, user friendliness, uh, we are there's still a way to go there and uh, you get used to certain styles, but is this the ultimate one that you want for yourself and it's the most logical one? That is always the question. So, um, but cables also needed to develop and today when I see how people uh, use the cable to, uh, to send content uh, to the big screen, that takes sometimes also a couple of minutes until it works. So we are in the beginning of the development or we are 
in progress or further developing, and I think uh, we have a fair chance to get there. What you said earlier, I think, is key. We just need to be very clear about uh, what our human our human interaction should be, and how we technically make this uh, work in the best possible way. Okay. Okay. Interesting points and probably worth a, a, a webinar on its own, but we have to, to move on or to cover the ground. Um, so perhaps uh, it's an appropriate moment to introduce Catherine Murphol. I guess it was you. There's something about the, the big Zoom logo on you that is a dead giveaway, and that's marvellous because I believe that you risk of biasing the whole proceedings. I think your your solution is moving in the right way in terms of ease of use. It's, it, 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 it is, um, uh, now I'm going to ask you to move if you don't mind and come up perhaps you can take this microphone here or What we're looking at here specifically is UC Solutions. Um, in my intro, I put UC Solutions extend the reach of remote workers and work groups, colleagues and partners in other locations, choosing a solution and compatible hardware, be it a telephone or a touch screen, is, is the task. Now, Zoom has made some fairly recent announcements about hardware mm -hmm. that goes with the solution. I wonder if, if, if in 10 minutes, if it's not impossible, can you give us some insights into the way that that's, work, that's moving? Yes, it's, um, thank you. It's, it's definitely changing a lot. I've been with a company for over three years now, and we went from pretty much working only on iPads in our conference rooms to now working with a variety of hardware um, providers, which is mostly why we have presence here in a couple of different booths. Uh, some providers are even moving forward to having their hardware work solely with Zoom. Meet is one of them, D10. So the D10, whole idea. Yeah. So you're on D10, please just say Yes, we are. So uh, we've been partners with them for a while, though. Um, but Zoom really started from a um, cloud perspective that was meant to just work from any device anywhere. The hardware piece is more of a recent one. Mm -hmm. And is there, what were you looking for when you made these recommendations? Because there are any number of people now making hardware that could work with Zoom and often does work with Zoom, but you specifically endorse certain brands. What, what was the, the, the Yeah, style? well, you know, it's interesting. And I mean, I, I'll be humble here. I'm not sure I was part of the decision-making team of <laughs> when we work with those people. But originally, the whole positioning was that we were a hardware agnostic. We wanted to offer a solution to replace bigger more expensive systems out there that you know will require a maintenance contract and a lot of investment on front and so it was important for the, our solution to just offer something that could use any piece of hardware that's very commonly used and if a room is dismantled i always tell customers if you dismantle your room it's not an issue you can reuse your view sonic screen for another purpose you can reuse your tablet so that's kind of all it all started the impression I've got myself is that with time, because Zoom became a platform that was better known, more public, more better positioned constantly with the Gartner Quadrant, those partners also came to us and wanted to do business because we're all about user friendliness. We're all about delivering happiness and all those things, but ultimately to make it as simple as possible. And so that's kind of how those relationships are starting. And it's just, coming with time that we have more and more and more partners but that's definitely not how we started we just wanted to be as agnostic as possible and now things are just growing like that are there factors that make certain brands flavors of hardware more appropriate for, for zoom usage that where the philosophy of zoom is more in tune as with the hardware provider if, if I think that we are more in tune with one of them, mm -hmm. I wouldn't go as far as that. Again, not that I'm part of the product team. I think it's more that we're looking for partners who are probably sharing the same philosophy of mm -hmm. keeping the low, the cost low, keeping things flexible, um, mobile as much as possible. If not, you know, I think you were just mentioning like it's always overly really complex with cables, with this, with that, with starting, right? As long as somebody will share the same 
philosophy for our users in our environment, then we just more and more, we're, we'll associate ourselves with big brands like Logitech, but with smaller brands, like I think Meet is not necessarily the biggest brand right now, but that's another example. May, may I just talk to that point? Of course. Um, one of the challenges we face in UC is unified collaboration, right? Unified. Mm -hmm. So the key word is multiple parties, unified, unification. So one of the challenges we face as an industry is we have Zoom, we have WebEx, we have Microsoft Teams, we have Skype for Business, we have all these different UC platforms, Cisco, et cetera. Everyone's fighting out for, for their niche market. They want to say they're the best. And, and I'm going to call, call it out to everybody. Everyone needs to learn to play nice with everybody else. Okay, the neat thing about a mobile phone, I can have an Apple phone, I can talk to a Huawei phone, I can talk to a Samsung phone, I can dial it up, and it's agnostic. And, and for UC to really, really go mainstream, we can't force people into ecosystems and say, you must use this, or you must use that, or you must use the other. Everyone needs to play nice together. Because, you know, some people might choose, oh, you know what, I'm going to go with this platform because it works for me. But I still want to talk to the people over here. So why should I learn a new interface or a new UI simply to talk to you? Why can't we just agree on a standard, we talk together, I use my stuff, you use store stuff. But we want to think about collaboration. It's about voice and video. It's a really simple thing, right? I talk to you, we video, maybe we do a little bit of messaging. So the concept of aggregation of multiple platforms into a single unified thing is the whole point of unified collaborations, which is the topic of conversation yes. today. So my concern is these closed ecosystems that are appearing and that we're backing and we're not offering interoperability between ecosystems is actually a real concern. Mm -hmm. uh, why should I forklift upgrade and say, you know what, I was that and now I need to be that. So this is all dead now and I'll have to buy this. Okay, that, that's not really a good choice for customers. The new thing about open source and the internet, the whole purpose of the internet was to give people choices. Open source code, we can be flexible, we can go left, we can go right, we can change. Maybe these guys are good today, but tomorrow maybe they're not so good. So yeah, one of the things I do see a problem is everyone's facing off and trying to build closed ecosystems. Uh, and you know, to me, that's a problem. I agree very much with you because the whole premise that I had for this conversation was also how to choose the best unified communication platform for your company. And exactly to your point, if, if any platform goes out there and says, we're better than this guy, this is not going to work together, then what if you have an enterprise of 10,000, 20,000 people who are all working with Microsoft Office Teams, and all of a sudden, you'll have anybody in video conferencing trying to push their own thing, and it's not working, and we're trying to facilitate things that to your point, always say, and when I say we, and I'm talking generally speaking in video conferencing and collaboration, the more integration possible, the better. Because when you talk to customers, if they already have something in place that's working, maybe an aspect of it won't be working, but maybe if customers are using Slack and they love it and it's working great, then the best is to find the idea, how are you gonna integrate and make it seamless as much as possible so that their users are still able to keep doing what's working well, and hopefully whatever else they add as a solution to that will just make it that much better. Mm. Yeah. This, and this really speaks to the generation gap, um, the, the millennials versus say the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Trust me, they have very different work styles. And the, the, the comms platforms or the collaboration platforms are out there suit different generations. Slack's a great example. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very millennial platform, okay? Uh, you know, Microsoft Teams is a very enterprise platform. Zoom is a very progressive platform. You know, WebEx is a very traditional video conferencing platform. They all have their place. Now, Which is funny in itself to say a traditional yeah. video conferencing platform. So now we need to make sure they all work together. So, you know, that's the challenge. Because there are the generational gaps. Even within my company, we have four different collaboration platforms going, and usually they're generational. Yeah, and some, also, some of them will have an external need or some will have an internal need. Yeah. Some people will favor a specific platform to their external meetings. Um, I mean, of course, as a video conferencing provider, we will suggest for sure that the more unified you are, the, in our mind anyway, the better, because then it, it, at least it's all hosted on the one thing. But I think that in reality, for bigger companies anyway, you have to play it friendly. My phone has like 10 video conferencing applications. Right. <laughs> I'll keep it at two. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> because some people say this is the one we have to use corporately, right? Sure. We don't to participate in the external world, we have to accept the fact that they do it that way. And we just can't say, you know what, because we can't share the same software, we, we, we can't have a conversation. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, uh, you're a blah blah user. Oh, oh I'm an XYZ user. We can't talk. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. 
so uh, remote um, uh, coming in. And, uh, can I ask, <laughs> can I move you? I'm sorry. I to, haven't tossed one there. Yeah, <laughs> can I move you to over here with a spare mic or here? Um, it's just for my. Um, uh, oh, gosh, this is. Uh, we, we did not take all this, is, this was done by Iran. But um, now, this is going to be a slightly different presentation because it's got to do with the environment and the way that we we all understand that by using uh, UC solutions we can save on business travel we can save on so all of those definitions are clear irrespective of who you are I've yet to see someone stand up and say use our, our UC solution you'll burn more petrol or you'll have a bigger carbon footprint. Everyone does. I went to see um, uh, this is Ramel van Rune, who is the CEO of C-Touch. I went to see them in the summer of this year. And the thing that struck me, uh, this is a guy who's a hardware manufacturer, but actually wants to sell less hardware in some respects, because you don't have to buy functionality. Customers don't have to buy the functionality they don't want. They can recycle the base of the, of the solution and supplement it or change other elements if they want to add or uh, something new or, uh, or something. Uh, and I thought that's an interesting perspective for a hardware manufacturer saying, you don't need that bit or that bit, but you could have that bit and we're not gonna change the basic platform so that you can make those changes. So, Ramel, could you, could you explain a bit more about the BRICS concept? I think it's a challenge to our uh, entire business model. So we, we have to re reinvent and rework around this. I think to an extent, uh, Brian, you're, you're right in pointing out the, the, the starting of the conversation. We believe we are responsible as well in the products we carry to market. And we believe so uh, that we um, have an approach in a modular concept approach that uh, what you see happening in UC markets as well is that we integrating more and more technology and in the end the products are uh, capable of uh, more and more and set up less and less. What more and more also means is that they become technically more complex. Also I, I picked up something about user interfacing. User interfacing goes most of the times not really hand in hand with, with a product becoming more complex. But I think the essence of our story is that if you go the other way and you make the product less complex and more modular, you can make it uh, more future-proof because it's going to be, if the platform is right, if the quality of the platform and the components are uh, rightly chosen, you can um, upgrade the product over time. And this, uh, what, what it brings to you is uh, a proposition or an application that fits better to the customer at a certain point in time. And it also stretches the lifetime of the product. And we are after a stretched lifetime of the product because in the end, this will increase the CO2 footprint of our product. Yes. But it will also mean that we then will sell less products. So the challenge is um, in uh, going like for a reuse kind of concept, how can you uh, give um, uh, a, a right application, a right usage for your product, meaning you don't have just to think about a first time user, you always, always has to think about a second time or a third time user. And it also means taking more responsibility of your products or your solutions and uh, bringing ownership closer to the manufacturer instead of having the ownership at the customer's premises. We're can, almost there. Can I ask yeah. Craig and uh, Holger, as significant hardware manufacturer, what's your reaction to the idea that it might be a good thing to sell less units and make them give them longevity? Um, well, how do you, how do you react to that? Is it's not the traditionally V model at all, is it? Well, one one of the challenges it faces is utility of device, right? Utility, and, mm -hmm. and and software guys like Zoom, for example, uh, they constantly need more CPU, more GPU, more VPU, more this, more that, more memory, more resolution, more, 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 more. So really, the application defines the hardware platform, 
So if we slow down and say, okay, there'll be no more innovation in software, then we can probably stick with our hardware for the next 20 years. But that means we fundamentally lose the competitive edge because software fundamentally can out iterate hardware. So the speed at which software goes is probably an order of magnitude greater than hardware. You know, we, we probably do a major platform, hardware platform every 18 months, you know, from inception to mass production, we plan ahead. We do software, our software team, you know, ViewSonic is actually a software company. We have about 100 people writing software. We release the production every four weeks. <laughs> okay, so we have innovation hitting production every four weeks on software. We have innovation hitting production every 18 months on hardware. Which one do you think creates the better outcomes, the software or the hardware? Software. Obviously the software, right? So the challenge we face is if the software outruns the hardware and we're not willing to replace the hardware, then we lose the innovation. If you lose the innovation, we've hit singularity in the world. That is the rate of innovation is greater than the job replacement. Okay, so innovation is actually, we're losing jobs faster than we're creating. As fast as we innovate, it's not linear, right? So the companies that choose to go tech, and they adopt technology quickly and they replace and they invest and replace and invest, they get the competitive advantage. The people who choose not to do that or ultimately economically lose the advantage. So it's a dilemma. So what are we doing about it as a company? Recycling. Obviously, um, in Australia, for example, our team is very active with schools, helping them dispose of their old tech. Um, the, the great example is mercury, okay, bulbs, mercury bulbs and projection. Um, in some countries, it's a big deal. You just can't dispose of a bulb. You have to dispose of it you know, responsibly. So we've got some of our programmers and resellers in some countries actually doing disposal projects where they work with e-recyclers and actually recycle the waste. And then, you know, if it makes sense, we reuse the products. For example, um, you have an IFP, big screen like we've got here on the wall here. Maybe the projector that's being replaced, instead of throwing it away, maybe we orientate it in a different way and use it in the classroom in a different way. So instead of just replacing the projector and pulling it out and putting an IFP in place, we can actually rotate the projector around and maybe use it for you know, mapping or something, something cool in the classroom, some other engagement tool. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to necessarily throw everything out. We just maybe have to repurpose it. Um, so yeah, you have to make that decision. Um, environmental you know, responsibility is definitely part of the equation. And that might be recycling or repurposing, or even donation. You know, some of our you know, places in India, we actually take some of the technology and we give it to we, you know, we give it to a school that maybe can't afford the technology, and they're quite happy to take mm -hmm. the older technology and use it in their classroom while they wait for the budget to get the new technology. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple ways we can solve the the, the e-waste problem, and the e-waste problem is huge for our industry. Mm -hmm. um, look at the European Union right now, phone chargers. You know, they're going to standardise on a phone charger. Why? Because it's, you know, USB cable is the single biggest e-waste in the European Union right now, right? So how do we get rid of that? Standardized charges. So there's, there's not just individual manufacturers. I think as an industry, we need to really address this problem. And I think you, you repurpose comes very much or very close to reuse or stretch the lifetime of the product and should it be that your product is like outdated. So take care that the platform you're working around is like to some extent future proof. And uh, all the components that are less future-proof, like CPU power, etc., and the software, take them out. Don't take them for granted in your close proposition, but be able to uh, uh, update them over time to upgrade the product. Because we also believe that you should, the, the customer shouldn't be uh, trapped in a, a depreciating um, appreciation of the product. Because over time, he will like the product less and less because of features becoming irrelevant, not working. But the promise should be should stick to the customer and even grow over time. So that means you need to add, just I think that's Zoom proposition uh, as well, adding features over time so the, um, the promise to the customer keeps alive and he gets even better value for his money over time instead of less value for his money because of depreciation on product and on software side. But it also means that you need to rethink your business model as a company. Yes. Because uh, if you think in a traditional way, um, it affects your bottom line and affects uh, a lot of other factors. So we need to question ourselves, how do we use the technology? Um, and what's the purpose of uh, the technology that we use for? And uh, what we do with it? I mean, I'm sometimes flabbergasted about the fact that we are still selling XGA projectors, for example. People demand XGA projectors, a technology that is 20 years old and that they buy as an investment for the next uh, three years. And at home, we are talking about 4K uh, TV sets, for yeah. example. So that's, that is a huge gap that we see. And 
certain things come also with liability. So when you, for example, donate certain products uh, as a company, we are again liable for the products that we are giving out. So the basic principle, I fully agree, and uh, Delta stands for energy saving electronics to start with. So energy efficiency is for us extremely important, but recycle and reuse is a very important factor as well in this whole thing. But uh, I fully agree the complexity behind this quite uh, quite immense because we need to consider how do we use it for what is it used for because if you get a product donated but it doesn't support uh, the, the, the software application or what you want to connect to it's worth nothing so and then yeah. you still are stuck with certain things another factor that that i sometimes question especially in our industry is uh, that um, as soon as the technology is invented or introduced like 2k 4k 8k whatever we talk already at the time of introduction or use of the current technology about the next wave and the customer gets confused as well uh, while we are buying now 4k tv panels uh, we are watching still content based on 720p and if we are lucky on, on 1080p so that's a great point you know we talked about content before you asked the question about can i display all content on 4k displays well there's a lot of education content that's four to three it's lucky for 720p resolution. So when you upscale it onto a 4K panel, it looks terrible. So, you know, that's a great example where the content doesn't support the hardware platform. Mm -hmm. So you offered a 4K panel, but you, the reality is the content's not even up to snuff in terms of resolution. So just imagine how long the 4K panel is to last still in the industry before, before it becomes obsolete, right? Yeah. Well, the, there's an interesting factor here from a human, out, human point of view is the human retina can only really resolve 6K of resolution. So the big question I have for everyone in this room, do we really need 8K? Yeah. But that's, a whole, that's, a whole irony. that's the whole irony in that uh, when I was in the home cinema business, uh, I also learned that our, the rods in our eyes are related to uh, one megapixel, which is 720p, actually. So at the time, we introduced a fantastic three-chip 720p projector. The picture quality was extremely good. At the end, uh, a visitor asked, oh, this must be 1080p. And I said, no, it's 720p. And from one second to the next, it was the worst product and they would never buy it. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, end users and uh, whether it's corporate private user are very much driven by an uh, evolving technology and a perceived uh, quality because I fully agree. You buy today a 4K panel and the quality that you see may be worse than watching it at a 1080p. Uh, yeah. I, I had the pleasure of going to China many times and they, you know, China adopted 4K televisions for it's the biggest 4K television market of all, it drives the 4K panel market. But a lot of the broadcasters are still broadcasting, you know, 720p. Mm -hmm. So you've got this beautiful 4K panel with broadcast of 720p mm -hmm. and it looks really bad. It's pixelized. <laughs> so you've got mass broadcasting to a billion people in 720p on everyone, everyone's got a 65 inch 4K television at home. But they're very proud that they have a 4K panel and that's, that's of course fantastic. So, so therefore I think also like uh, going, going to, to Zoom, I think in the end the, the, the contents you create, they come most close to the application and to the usage of the customer. And that, that's what they appreciate most. And I think the, the hardware the industry as we know it is more becoming a carrier of the software platforms. So I think the, the, the software should be like, that's always like the, the, the basis of making the next step and the hardware is to follow and to support this software and this user experience. Not keeping your prices affordable. Affordability is value, you know, it's yeah. funny, everyone yeah, here has, sure. a lot of people have an iPhone here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you choose to buy an iPhone, you could buy a hundred dollar Android phone, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. It's very subjective so, to say affordable, but yeah. how about on <laughs> par or better competitive pricing? The, the value structure is very important. What do you, what do you value, right? And, and value is very subjective. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I think that's also a, a tendency you see mostly, I would say like in the more mature sectors of the AV industry, it's just like keeping that projectors or large display. We tend to go like this for this red race where you um, make like new technology, but new technology should come like an even lower price than the old technology was. And it's like a race to the bottom where application wise or need wise, the customer is not really does not have this demand for this 8K, for instance. Again, it comes more to what the application is and in reflection to what you're mentioning about um, in the reuse of products and giving away products. I think we, we support in changing the business model, not going for the, the giveaway uh, approach, but uh, give actually new value to the product and have a new sales cycle to the product. 
So actually what you're doing, you are extending the sales, the longevity of the product. So it's for a longer time in the market, but you also make um, the product to have uh, a new income line for a new customer. And this can be a customer in India, it can be a customer in Africa or less developed countries. But at that moment, this product will be suitable for them, for their needs and also to their budget. But it's, it's again that in the business model, it will be uh, this, this one product you sell several times. That's the whole idea. Yeah. You just need to do it. Yeah. No, we all need to agree to do it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the starting point. But you have to start somewhere. And I think it's, it's on, on the responsibility of the person, yeah. of the company, to, to make it again. We need to start the, the whole sustainability issue is the yeah. software yeah. drivers for that. It's our fault. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact that it's the software because we keep updating our platforms and asking more and more of the hardware, that's what you say? Well, how is that? How's my response? Uh, that, that, yeah, well, how would you respond to that? I mean, there is the, no solution because you're so to blame. You know, they want 4K, <laughs> they want 4K <laughs> streaming, okay? Yeah. So we have to put in coders and decoders and bigger yeah, yeah. network pipelines. And we're very and proud about it. Yeah. We're very comfortable on it. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's the challenge is we're always playing that game. You know, how do we keep ahead of the competition? I mean, we use the specs as the game. That's stay ahead rather than customer service or customer satisfaction or corporate responsibility to the environment, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. you know, if we keep playing the spec game where we just say better, cheaper, faster, better, cheaper, faster, better, cheaper, faster, yeah, there's no real need yeah. for better, cheaper, faster. On the other hand, you also just said that value is very subjective and I agree with you. However, if you're going to put me in Skype 10 years ago versus what Zoom or our competitors have to offer right now, I believe that yes, our platforms, I'm, I'm talking about video conferencing, might be asking more of the hardware, of course, but it works. Do we need 4K? Maybe not. Do we keep getting better? We can have, again, I'm saying we as just like a general industry, people are now streaming live videos. People are, you mentioned China, like the whole situation right now, they can do, schools are teaching their students because the students cannot go to school. It's all done video, video conferencing. You need somebody who's gonna be high quality if you're doing something, anything else than the acetate presentation. So I'll give you a counterpoint. Um, 4K television, there's a very interesting thing with 4K, real 4K and in real um, broadcast, live broadcast. They had to develop 4K makeup. I'm sure. Right? Yeah. And they actually had to sack a lot of newscasters because they were too old to actually broadcast because the 4K makeup couldn't cover up and it was an aesthetics issue. So 4K was introduced, you know, they had to build 4K makeup, like literally 4K makeup, and then people lost their jobs because Unfortunately, there's too much resolution in the broadcast. <laughs> well, then to that point, it's the same so that people who probably let go when radio was let go that. because of TV, yeah. and that's right. Yeah. You want to stop technology just, where it is. I, actually, I don't. I'm just giving you a, a counterpoint, right? Is that there was actually unintended consequences of resolution. Yeah. Um, another great example is watch the Pirate Carib Pirates of the Caribbean, the crab scene when the, the crabs are lifting the boat, right? Uh, you watch it in 1080p, it's very natural, it's very good, it's a little bit soft. You can see it. You watch it in 4K, you can see the digital artifacts. You just go, oh wow, this is a digital movie now. It loses mm -hmm. the concept of reality and it goes to a complete digitization. And so you, you lose the whole element of the movie of making it photorealistic. But I think it's also a generational difference and a cultural difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to learn that, for example, uh, when we talk about calibrated images to D65 or whatever in India, nobody cares because they want to have a strong red, green, and blue, and they don't <laughs> care whether it's natural or not. So um, Saturation colors, right? Yeah. So it's, um, I think, at the end of the day, it's a matter of uh, what, how do we really use the technology, what for, and sometimes it is perhaps better to um, focus more on the ease of use rather than adding more and more and more for the purpose of whatever um, competitive advantages. The problem only is that if some company has a very advanced technology and the first hardware manufacturer uh, supports that uh, the rest will suffer, and then you have to uh, think. Oh, you yeah. it's making so, thing called capitalism, the market economy. <clears throat> we talked. Yeah, we talked about uh, the other day about audio. The audio industry learned many, many years ago that uh, the, the the quality in audio is perceived value. You can, of course, technically put certain measures up, but that's basically it. Unfortunately, in our display industry and uh, the way we communicate, we see always in better quality, more details, and things like that. And people are amazed when they see for the first time a car race in 4K, throw PlayStation or whatever it is. So 
I sometimes uh, I sometimes believe, and I think you mentioned that earlier, that uh, we need to have technology for the purpose, and that can have variations. And it doesn't mean that if uh, the, the purpose is not as advanced as another one, it needs to be much, much cheaper than uh, something else, and that uh, the best technology doesn't support a uh, better outcome if you don't have the purpose for it. And uh, so, but I do not know it's a matter of how we all change our, uh, our, our approach to all of this. But the neat thing about this conversation is the problem won't be solved because we all want to have a competitive advantage. <laughs> and we are all in technology. So that's yeah, the yeah, little, yeah. It's sort of like a circular conversation. Yeah, in principle, it's a great idea. But the reality is the competitive advantage is always the leg up. You know, everyone's looking for that silver bullet that makes them different. You know, Zoom's looking for the bullet. You guys are looking, Delta's looking for the bullet. You guys are looking for the bullet. Everyone's looking for the silver bullet. bullet. And, and that's the challenge we face in the industry because people rarely agree. You know, industry standards are very hard fought for. Sometimes they take decades before they're standardized. You know, video conferencing standards, for example, is a great example. Video codecs, we're still arguing. It'll be H.2627 next year, and it'll be H.2347, and then, you know, you're just iterating over the next 10 years in different video standards and video codecs. So we can't even agree on a codec, let alone a hardware product. Mm. So, you know, there's some challenges. I also think that this conversation, as, as we like uh, representatives from the industry, this is very much uh, a conversation with relation to the industry. If you had this conversation with corporate accounts, they look to this in, I would say, in a way more, more open in their attitudes. And they are very willing to uh, adopt new ideas around circularity. So if you, of course, everybody is seeking around to find this holy grail to uh, have some competitive advantage. We believe circularity can certainly add to it. It doesn't mean it's like on number one, because number one, it's still the traditional conversation we have is on the application side, on the future readiness of the product, on the specs, on these kind of things, and on the user experience. But it, it, it can come close and add a flavor over those four or five topics. And we believe the big corporates, they, they have their social responsibility and they have this on their agenda and it's, it's, it's of key, they have this defined to their KPIs. And if you, if you have a link to their KPIs, um, that was our experience so far in the last year, uh, it, it's, it's a good starting point of having your conversations and opening your business. So we certainly think it brings competitive advantage to it, but you need to talk to the right people within within the organization and, and try to have the right attach in your ideas. And it's it's also bringing and not being afraid of bringing the idea forward and having the discussion around it because it's a discussion that, in first instance, it looks to be a side of what we're actually talking about. But if you then relate it back to the experience they are looking for. This is also part of the, the, the experience they're looking for because it's also part of their corporate identity. So fit for purpose and utility is, is very important. Sure. And, and we don't sell fit for purpose and we don't sell utility right now. We sell gland, we sell spec, we sell yeah. it's better, cheaper and faster. You should buy it. Please consider our purchase because our business models need better, cheaper, faster. There's not a company in this room that can't afford to do that non better cheaper faster model, model of business right now there's, there's always going to be new shiny new things yeah and are we individually prepared to uh, scale down and go back to the basics and say okay that's sufficient i mean when we all started using um, um, outlook or um, microsoft office in general i mean i i don't know how many times i'm using uh, word for example i hardly use a Excellent PowerPoint. That's today the thing, and then there are a few mails, and that's the way we communicate. So it's also a matter of how do we relate to technology, uh, what do we expect from it, and um, as I said, does it serve the purpose? So I, thought, I also think that better doesn't always mean like it's, it's technically better. Better can also be more suitable to the customer's needs, and if you have a good story around this and it actually fits better the needs of the customer, it's not adding uh, another pen to it or another pen color or another whiteboard or 26 macros to it or whatever. I think you, your Zoom whiteboard, which is uh, a basic whiteboard, but it, it fits the needs of 95%. Now, why, why to go for the other 5%? 
it wouldn't add to your CO2 footprint, by the way, but it's in like overspecking the product, in giving you overpromised products um, in, in this race. I think if you just match the requirement of the customers in a basic way, I think that, that that's, that's a good way forward. You phone salespeople talk like that. No, no. I'm not a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, um, it's 3.30 and I promise to end on time. I appreciate everyone here has got an awful lot to do in a show like this. But thank you to all of our presenters, to Ramel, Craig, Catherine, and to Zahata Olga. Thank you very much indeed. I hope those who came along to listen and are listening online felt that it was useful. I certainly did. I thought it was very good indeed. Um, may even do another one, you know, soon. Maybe not too soon. But um, thank you very much again, and I'm really pleased that all of you came along. It was made an excellent panel. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.